washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, I will lay my trophies down, all down at Jesus' feet. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And let's uh, go right over across the page to Jesus is all the world to me. Life, my joy, my joy. Jesus is all the world to me. My life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without Him I would fall. When I am sad to him I go, no other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad, he's my friend. Jesus is sing just the first stanza of Jesus. Yeah. 
I hope that you all know that Jesus loves you. Amen. And we are all little in Jesus' sight. Jesus is big and powerful, and we need him every single day. We're so glad that you're here today. We're glad to see our visitors, and we pray that you'll be blessed by this service. We know that wherever two or three are gathered, Jesus is in our midst. And so we're so thankful that he is willing to meet with us. We must always be willing to meet with him. Pray that you'll all have a blessing today. We have a lot of things going on, and um, I like what it says in the, Bible, in the, in the bulletin, this is leap year day. <laughs> we get an extra day this year. What are we doing with it? Well, we're worshiping God, and that's a good thing, isn't it? And it's very unusual to have five Sabbaths in February. And I think what happened is a lot of, pe a lot of uh, organizations in our church decided this would be a good time for some meetings. That's where some of our people are. Um, some of our elders are gone to an elders meeting at the uh, NAD. And uh, there's also a grief recovery seminar that's at Sligo Church. So we, I know several of our people are there. but. We are here, and we are here to worship. Amen. We have some uh, amazing things going on. I'd like Deborah to come up here. She has something to tell us about the upcoming Diabetes Undone Workshop. Just a week away? Is that true? <laughs> so I think most of you saw our little video um, several weeks ago. But you know, diabetes, it's predicted that this year in 2020 is going to affect 50% of the people in the United States. Some people don't, might not know that they even have it. They have prediabetes, but this is, does cause catastrophic um, results to your health. So if you know somebody that needs help, this is an amazing seminar. Um, Sunday, March 8 is going to be an information and sign up at Merit Club, is they're partnering with us. Merit is in Eldersburg. If you need to know where that is, um, just come and see me. I have more flyers. If you want somebody, personally invite them. If um, they need support, come with them. You won't need to. The the participant that needs the help will be needs to. There is a fee for that, but you can be a support person and come and watch with them and be there to encourage them, walk with them, help them try out new recipes. Um, that personal connection will definitely be a bonus for anybody that you know that needs this. So we're excited about it. Our uh, team is going to be getting together this afternoon to work on um, all the final details. Uh, if you have any questions, please see me and um, please pray that this will reach the community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deborah. You know, this is a very personal thing. Uh, we all have people in our families that are suffering, and uh, one out of two, huh, that like half of us here could be affected. And so it, it, it is a life-threatening thing. At this time, we're going to uh, remember something that Jesus said. Because I think these are very troubling times that we have, uh, not just physically, but spiritually, so many things that are happening. And I think that every day we should listen to the words of Jesus in John 14. I think a lot of you know this by heart. And what he's saying to us is, let not your heart be troubled, right? Let not your heart be troubled. Do you want to say it with me? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. What a wonderful promise. Let's keep that in mind as we worship today.
Father in heaven, we come as we are, knowing that your Holy Spirit is here to speak to our hearts. All our longings, all our burdens, everything we leave it up to him. And I pray that, Lord, our, our going from here will not be in vain. Please bless all the worshipers and their families today. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. Time now for our children's story, which uh, Curtis will be uh, giving this morning. And if the uh, children would, please uh, go get your baskets and uh, for the children's offering.
It's always good to have a crowd to talk to. Uh, um, there's one thing I just want to say before I start this, which I didn't even tell my wife I was going to be doing, but uh, this is probably the last St. Nature story I'm going to be giving. Um, my, my memory is getting worse and worse and worse. And it was, it was a struggle to put this thing together for me. It took me like three days instead of uh, one, one evening. So it breaks my heart. That's just one of my, my favorite things to do. But uh, like I said, I'm, I'm just, my memory just ain't what it used to be. Well, for right now, we can, we can pretend, I, I'm, I'm changing the name of this place. We, we are not in a church. We are in the Taylorsville Nature Center. I'm going to be talking about what you see on the screen there, which are prairie dogs. And I, and I, and I, my, my glasses can't even see what I, I've got up there. Yeah. The qu okay, how many different, you may have heard of, how many, have you ever heard of prairie dogs? There's one person shaking, you ever heard of your, I got two people shaking their head. You've heard of prairie dogs too? Okay, I get a few. Well, I, I'm expecting the grown-ups here would have heard of prairie dogs, but the kids may, maybe not, not, not so much. But uh, like I said, the uh, question is, you know, how, how many different, maybe you didn't realize there's more than one kind of prairie dog. How many different kinds of prairie dogs do you think there are? Two, three, four? Actually, there are over about 20 different kinds of prairie dogs. And uh, some of them, there, there's Gunnison's prairie dogs. I, I never heard of that one before I started doing, making, making this up. White-tailed prairie dogs? No. Black-tailed prairie dogs? Remember this one. I'm going to be talking about black-tailed prairie dogs for this particular talk. Uh, Mexican prairie dogs, Utah prairie dogs, and there's about 15 more, more different kinds of, of prairie dogs. Uh, and today we're going to be looking at black-tailed uh, prairie dogs, and I can't see the bottom of the screen back there, so I may have to turn around here to see what, what, what's, what's up there. Uh, and one of the things you'll notice, there's a little circle around the, the tail of that, and what color is, the, is, the, is it? Black. That's why they call it a black-tailed prairie dog. Very, very logical. I, I just happen to have a prairie dog with me, by, by the way. A black-tailed prairie dog. There he is, sitting up there. He's checking you all out. Would, would some of you kids like to... you? Know, Look at it, play with it while I'm, while I'm talking, because what I'm saying could be really, really boring. You have a lot more fun, you know, looking at the prairie dog. Share it, though, okay? Okay, well, like I said right there, 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 there there's, the, there's the black tail up there, which explains the first part of their name. But the question is, what about the dog part? Come on. Okay. Well, to begin with, they, they live in prairies, which is, which is logical. That's one of the reasons they call prairie dogs prairie dogs is because they live on prairies. Is that logical, kids? Hmm? Does that make, make, make sense? And up there, there's a map of the United States, and, and you can see that the Great Plains states is where the prairie dogs live. And you can find them all the way from the Canadian, just about the Canadian border, all the way down to the Mexican border, and that, that whole area right there. It's a relatively a low rainfall area, and, it's, and prairie dogs just kind of, kind of love, love that. Um, the, the, for, this is a nostalgia thing for the older people which are here. How many, how many people used to like drive from here out to California and back before they had interstates? <laughs> I, I guess I'm dating myself by, by saying this, but the, 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 well, well, if, if you drive from here up up uh, north to Pennsylvania, you can see there's a zoo off to one side there as, as you go up to 15, right? Those sorts of things used to be all, all over the place, and they used to they used to have, you know, prairie dog places. There's 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 a billboard right there, advertising prairie dog town that you could go to and look at prairie dogs until you fell asleep. <laughs> they're not they're cute, but not terribly exciting. Um, 
in, in there, if you want to see some prairie dogs nowadays, you can't go there, but there are some national parks which are kind of like heavy on prairie dogs. If you find yourself traveling out, out west someplace, uh, Devil's Tower, there's a picture of Devil's Tower right, right there. I'm not going to go into why they call it Devil's Tower. <laughs> uh, Wind Cave, Badlands Park, Theodore Roosevelt Park. Unfortunately, all these are in South Dakota, so they could be off your beaten track. But if you're going out, going to Northern California or Oregon, or say, you know, go, go by there and uh, go to this national park. It's really kind of cool, and you can see prairie dogs there. Okay, okay, uh, okay. So well, that explains the prairie part of, of their name. But why are they called dogs? Do they look anything like a dog? They, they talk to each other by barking. Hence the name of the prairie dog. These little prairie dog are barking. Yep, 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 yep. Actually, I don't know if that's how they sound, but it sounds good to me. Sometimes they really get into it, and they, they, they bark at the moon. They're just standing up, just barking their little, little, little heads off right there. I wish I had a recording, but uh, I couldn't find one online. So I feel, let's, uh, let's talk about a few other things. What, what do prairie dogs eat? Ever thought about that? <laughs> no. Who ever thinks of that except a biologist like me? They, 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 you'll appreciate this. They're mostly vegetarians. Cool. And if you'll bear with me, there's a, there's a, there's a short list of what they eat. There's a whole list of things that they, they like to eat. Western wheat grass, buffalo grass, blue gram, or whatever that is. Sedge, gold malab, all, all the way down. Occasionally, they kind of depart from their vegetarian Habit, habits, and they eat worms, cutworms, grasshoppers, old or fresh American bison droppings. Ew! <laughs> they have a somewhat varied diet. <laughs> where do prairie dogs live? They live where? Where does it say they live? Where does it say that they Yeah, Yes, on their prairie, but where in the prairie do they they live underground. Uh, more, on, more on this in a minute. Do, do they live alone or do they have families? Are they, they loners or are they, they, they family things? We'll, 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 want to guess? Yeah, it's 50 50 chance. You're right. To start with, they live in a hole in the ground surrounded by a ring of dirt. There's one poking his hair up out, head up out of the ground. Why do you think they have a, a, there's two reasons why they have that ring of dirt around there. One is when they dig it out, the dirt's got to go someplace. But also, it makes a little dam all the way around it. So if it rains heavily, all the rainwater doesn't go down into their burrows. Smart little guys. Actually, they, they don't live in a hole in the ground. They live in a multi-room home. Want to take a tour of a, of, of a Prairie dog home? Here you go. There is the prairie dog. It's a two bedroom home with nursery, safety features, and extra storage space. Sounds like a, a, a real estate ad in the newspaper. <laughs> okay, there, there's, it's even, it even has an, an indoor bathroom. These, these are tidy little guys. They've got an indoor bathroom so they don't have to go outside where, where, where Bad things could happen to them, which we'll talk about uh, briefly. Why such an elaborate home? You know, God must have loved them when he created them if, if he built that into their brain. I, I want you guys, you guys are so cute, you've got to have a good home to live in. Sometimes prairie dogs connect their burrows underground from one to another, so they actually have an underground prairie dog city, which is a really kind of a cool idea, but then again, they're social animals. Unfortunately, prairie dogs' lives aren't peaches and cream. Little, the, the, my, my audience in the front row have probably no idea what that means. Maybe most, some of you don't. I'm dating myself. Yeah, life isn't easy, easy going. Because there are these guys, black-footed ferrets. The favorite thing that they like to eat is prairie dogs. Uh, 
In fact, here's a, they love to go hunting prairie dogs, and here's one who's apparently, I don't know if he was successful or not, but sticking his head up out of a prairie dog hole. Well, okay. Here, here's, here's kind of a floor plan right right there. there there's the under, underground thing. That's where the, where the ferrets go. Now, now, what do you think would happen if a fox or a ferret went into a, a, a dog's, dog's home? Well, there's smart... Well, it, you know, God made the prairie dog smart enough to have an escape route. And those arrows right there kind of shows that, uh, well, if a ferret's trying to get in, guess what? They've got a secret way out, a, an exit, an emergency exit. Is that cool or what? Are prairie dogs smart or what? <laughs> Um, you know, praise, you know, all I can say is you praise God for all the wonderful things that the God has made, including these prairie dogs. And I could talk a whole lot longer, but I don't want to put you to sleep. Thank you, Curtis. I'm sorry to hear that was your last uh, story, though. Our offering uh, today is for the uh, North American Division uh, in Evangelism. If the uh, deacons would please come forward. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you for all the gifts that you've given us, for all the... Uh, for all the uh, answered prayers and all the blessings that you give us, we uh, now return a portion of that of those blessings uh, to you. We ask that you bless these these uh, monies that they will go to uh, fulfill your will. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the time when we have our special time of prayer and praise to the Lord. Uh, I know these are troublous times and we need to be praying for the situation around the world. We talked in our Sabbath school about the virus, the virus of sin that is affecting us all. And we want God to come and purify us and take us from the contamination of this world to the purification of his world. But there are many things on our hearts, I know, so if there's anything you'd like to uh, ask for, this is your time. Yes. Well, my, my dad died Tuesday, so oh. pray for me and my family. Sorry to hear that, Bill. Well, this is right. Yes, Marcy? Ditto. The same, ditto. My father died, yeah. Your father died? Yeah, the funeral's Monday. Oh, okay. 
Uh, now I remember just, was it two years ago your mother died? A little over a year ago. A little over a year, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm afraid for Richard and not feeling great. He asked for his brother. Apparently his brother's quite sick and needs prayer. Okay. Did I see him here this morning? Yeah, he was here and he left. He didn't feel well. So. Right. How is his wife doing? She's doing okay. She's doing okay. Sure. All right. Well, we need to be praying for him and his family. Stanley? Um, my, my sister and my support group and my family. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody want to praise the Lord today? Raise your hand. <laughs> I want to praise the Lord. Amen. And uh, we all have things on our hearts, I know. But we all know that there's a promise of something better to come. So that's what we're here for. As far as possible, let us kneel as we pray. <laughs> Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful to you because you are a prayer answering and a prayer hearing God, and that you care about everything that is on our hearts. You care for our welfare, our families, but most of all, you want to see us in your kingdom. And so we pray that we may be your children, your sons and daughters that can be happy and rejoice with you in the earth made new. And we pray that we may be able to be faithful to bring others with us to show them that love. We know that there are today those that mourn, Bill and Marcy, who have lost their fathers. We're thankful that you are our Heavenly Father and that you will give us comfort. We know that this is not all there is to life. We pray that you'll be with Stanley as he seeks to be a witness to all of his people around him, his group that he is um, in charge of, that he goes every t week to, vi to witness to your goodness and your power. We pray that you'll help each one of us to have someone that we will share your love with and that we can uh, do your will we pray that you'll be with this upcoming series on diabetes, that we may be able to show people the better way, not just physically, but spiritually, that you want us all to live and prosper. We're thankful that you're such a kind and loving God. We pray that you will be with those who are ill. We think of Richard and Ellen and Richard's brother, we pray that you'll be with them. And also Kim's mother, who is uh, suffering with the results of chemotherapy, we pray that you'll be with her and comfort her. We know that our time on earth is only a short time, but you have eternity in which we are to love and be loved and worship. We pray that each one of us will be there. We pray for those that are missing today for other meetings, and we pray that you'll be with them, especially I pray for Estelle, that she may find comfort and that she may be able to continue to work for you. We thank you for the way that you have shown us this marvelous truth, and we pray that we may be faithful to you to the, till the end. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for being a loving God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 It's time for the scripture reading, and it is Luke chapter 23, verse 43. And he answered him, 
Truly I tell you today, you shall be with me in paradise. Thank you, Scott, and also uh, Brother Curtis for that beautiful uh, children's story, something that enhances our knowledge. I also want to thank our visitors among us, uh, especially uh, I'm delighted to see uh, Brother John Clyde and Pari and their uh, grandchildren. Uh, Probably this is my wife and I have, uh, this is the, our first time to see them. So it's so good to see them. And also there's a visitor over there, uh, Brother Ricardo and his family. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Let's have a word of prayer, Father in heaven. At this time, I pray that, Lord, uh, you'll speak to each heart in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, the Gospel of Luke chapter 23, verse 43, says, And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. I say to you today, comma, actually, remember in the original there is no punctuation. Punctuations were added only later. And so uh, that is... Uh, the reason why that makes sense is that Jesus did not go to heaven on that day. He told Mary a few days later, I have not ascended to heaven yet. And so actually he was here on this earth for 40 days. I believe some of us probably have been near or even held the arms of a person who is dying. Have you? Anybody? Unfortunately, I have a couple of times. My mother and uh, my sister, I could name a few, not too long ago, and someone else in Connecticut. I believe that most of us who have been there would admit that it's not so easy to speak to a dying person. Not easy. Telling him or telling her about their impending death or dying, or trying to convey words of assurance of salvation. You know, sometimes there's a code of silence seems to be a much easier choice, avoiding the very topic that a dying friend might need. But let me tell you something this morning. As we find in the scripture, that Jesus had no difficulty ministering to a dying person and giving them words of hope. As followers of Jesus, we have a lot to learn from him, especially with a dying person. Sometimes uh, I resort to singing with a dying person uh, or some hymns that the person might be knowing. And uh, years ago, my wife and I ministered to a dying person in Newmarket, Virginia. I'm sure many of you know her name, uh, Ella Mae Stoneburner. Uh, GC uh, person and she passed away a few minutes later after we sang hymns that was quite an experience and my father died uh, singing my brother told I was too young to remember I was only seven but uh, seven a lot of people know every detail but I didn't quite remember how exactly my father died, but my brother told me that he, he, he sang in the sweet by and by as he was passing away. You see, Jesus would jump right into the opportunity to save one more person, even at the last hour of his death on the cross. Because there on the cross, Jesus wanted to jump right into the opportunity to save one more person. This thief who accepted him now actually was not so innocent a few minutes ago or a few hours ago. Joining the crowd, mocking at Jesus. But a few hours later, he accepted Jesus Christ 
and even call him Lord, Lord, with a conviction, of course. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Luke chapter 23, verse 43. Remember me. You just don't call Jesus Lord unless you have that conviction or accept him as the Lord of your life. And the reply of Jesus was, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you shall be with me in paradise. You see, the hospice chaplains are very expert in ministering to a dying person. Actually, I was told by them that the, a dying person, the moment you minister, that is the most important time, they say. Very crucial. The story of this thief shows that people can change, can have change of heart, even in their dying moment. My sister told me, I was not there either, I was here in the U.S., that my youngest brother who died accepted Jesus Christ in the hospital bed. But we wonder, what made this thief change his mind? What circumstances led him to this conviction to even call Jesus as Lord? He was not like this few minutes ago. You see, this thief was taking part in deriding and mocking Jesus up to this time. But what led him to this stage? Let's find out together this morning. You see, this thief was a, a career criminal. He was bad to the bone, as some, someone would express it. This thief at first joined the crowd, joined the enemies of Jesus, deriding, in, uh, hurling insults at Jesus. Perhaps you're saying, oh, I, I thought this, this thief was a good man. The other one was bad. Not so. The gospel writer Matthew made the, this very clear. In Matthew 27, verse 44, this is what we find. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled with him with the same thing. Reviled with the same thing. Wow. You see, this, this word revile here means heaping insult on the person. This dying thief a few minutes ago was not so innocent after all. Before, his conversion, his attitude was like that of his partner of the crime, who's hanging just few, uh, on the other side of Jesus. I do not know, friends, if this thief was a greater sinner than the other thief. Either of them could have been on Jerusalem's most, most wanted list at that time. Now here's a lesson for all of us. I know there are many legalistic Christians today who take the position that our good deeds saved us. Salvation by works is taught in their doctrine. There are some legalistic Christians who say that our good deeds are sort of like in a balance, okay? And if our good deeds outweigh the bad deeds in the judgment, we will be saved. They really believe that. I've got news for those people. Well, let me ask you, was it was only too late for this dying thief to start a new beginning? This thief on the cross has no chance to make good deeds and bad deeds balance in his life. But how come Jesus still promised him paradise? Go figure. <laughs> the thief on the cross had no chance to be saved by his good deeds, period. A well-known writer by the name of Arthur Pink, you probably have read his book. Uh, in his book, The Seven Sayings of Jesus on the Cross, uh, this was published by Bible Truth Depot, uh, said about this dying thief this way. Let me quote. The thief on the cross could not walk in the path of righteousness for there was nail through either foot. He could not perform any good works for there was nail through either hand. He could not turn over a new leaf and live a better life because he was dying. What a statement that is. So this thief have no chance to have his good deeds and bad deeds 
uh, weighing each other. The Bible never teaches that salvation is something that you and I can earn by our good deeds. It's a free gift. Free gifts by Jesus. Whoever wants it, whoever want to take it. So Jesus clearly affirmed through the story of this dying thief on the cross that salvation is not something that you and I can earn by our good deeds. The thief on the cross had no chance to earn anything. He's totally helpless. And that's a good thing, by the way. You see, in spiritual realm, helplessness is our advantage. Amen? It's not a drawback or a curse if it draws us to the only one who can help us. A realization of helplessness in your life is a must in order to get help from the Savior. In fact, if we're not helpless, we don't need a helper. Amen? There on the cross in his last hour, the helpless thief had a change of heart and found the assurance of salvation from Jesus, a promise of paradise. Perhaps there are some here who are, uh, or someone who is watching there on internet, like the thief on the cross, you probably are helpless. Perhaps you're wishing that you could erase your past because your past sin bothered you. You, can't, you just can't get it passed by. I want to tell you, there's only one person who could help this dying thief and the dying robber who could help him erase all his past and help him stand before the heavenly court as if he's perfect. He's perfect because Jesus Christ lives in him now. He can help you and I too as well. Quite possibly this thief did not see Jesus until that very day. As the three men were being nailed to the crosses in the beginning, this thief probably thought Jesus was just another criminal. When the crosses were lifted up and lowered into their holes, the thief had no reason to believe that he was in the presence of greatness. You can tell as he joined the other thief, mocking and deriding, hurling insult on Jesus Christ. Golgotha was not a place one would expect to find a divine man hanging. What then changed his mind all of a sudden? What changed his mind all of a sudden? We can surmise. First he heard Jesus pray. Yes, he heard it all right. Loud and clear. How? Because he was crucified right there next to him, within earshot. He couldn't miss it. He heard Jesus pray, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, upon hearing this forgiveness stuff, okay, what do you think was going through the thief's mind at that time? I believe he was really shocked coming from the mouth of Jesus. Hmm. Only a, only a man who knew God well, only a man who is very close to God could pray such kind of prayer of forgiveness for his enemies. He must have thought that. Or surely he must have thought, surely this is a man of God. And since then, this incident pierced his conscience and slowly, slowly re realizing the stupidity and the blindness of his own heart. And all of a sudden he realized he's in the presence of a great person. And he realized his helplessness. He, he realized he too needed that forgiveness. If the man next to him prayed for others, he too realized, I need that forgiveness. Well, he had mocked Jesus a few minutes ago along with other thief, his partner in crime, along with the crowd. Now he feels guilty. Now he feels making a mistake in mocking this holy man and deriding a great person. Now, what other things might have contributed to change the mind of this dying thief? Yes, from the cross, this dying thief also heard the crowd chanting loud and clear, He saved others! 
Himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross. We will believe him. Well, this was enough for the thief to change his mind. Well, if he's able to save others, he must have some sort of divinity. Those kind of things flash through his mind. The thief knew these words were shouted in defiance, in ridicule, and he himself at one point had joined them, but now he wondered, what could they mean? He saved others. If that's the case, I too need to be saved. He can save me too. As the mob rehearsed some of the sayings and some of the miracles done by Jesus, the dying thief now pondered their mockery and he began to realize this just might be a savior. He just might be in the presence of a savior and this is what I need in my life. He's, he started pondering. Now he was... He has this conviction that this person is a godly man. This person is a divine man who could save others. Because the crowd said, he saved others. He saved others. I too need to be saved. Then this also had a good reason to think this, that this person crucified beside him might be a king of some sort. A ruler of some sort, somewhere. Why? What led him to think that when he saw the writings of Pilate nailed above the cross, it probably does not make sense to this thief in the beginning when at the glance. What writing? Luke chapter 23, verse 38. This is the king of the Jews. This is the king of the Jews. Nail right above the, 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 the head of Jesus. Yes, he heard it loud and clear, including the objections of some Jewish leaders, saying, do not write that. Instead, write this one. This man claimed to be the king of the Jews. He heard all those disputes. Yes, he also witnessed when Pilate, in a rare bur a burst of courage, would not change his mind. And so there it hung above the head of Jesus, the king of the Jews. So the thief at first probably didn't think much, but then he started wrestling in his mind. But then slowly led this to conviction. This man is a king. This man is a king. He's a man of some importance, perhaps a divine king. When Jesus was paraded through the streets of Jerusalem, this writing nailed at the top of the cross would have accompanied him, and this thief read it for sure, and more likely the others who read it with mockery, of course. And at any rate, he, he now believed that Jesus was the king, and now he accepted him as Lord. And so he cried out to, the, to Jesus, cry, saying, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So incredibly, this thief put all these ingredients together in his heart. All these were in ingredients for the thief to build his faith that later changed his heart and accept Jesus as Lord. And more so, he found real relief when Jesus promised him of paradise. This thief died with the assurance of salvation. This thief died in peace, just like my brother. My brother, whom I've been praying for almost 30 years. Well, he didn't want to join the church because oh, the church is full of, you know, he has all kinds of excuses because he didn't want to give up his chewing tobacco. And finally, about four months before, he gave up just cold turkey, and he was baptized. We are so happy. My wife and I were overjoyed. So this thief put all his ingredients together. This thief died with the assurance of salvation. He died in peace. He now has a future a paradise 
to live and to enjoy for eternity. What a story that is. What a hope that is for all of us. Amen? Let me ask you this. Do you have assurance of salvation this morning? Do we have difficulty in asking someone if they have assurance of salvation, especially in their dying bed? Do we have assurance of salvation? I tell you, all the apostles have assurance of salvation. Did you know that? Sometimes we say, oh, maybe, uh, maybe I'll be in heaven. Maybe, we are not very sure. See, assurance of salvation is very important. Apostle Paul said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness. He was very sure about it. That's assurance of salvation. Deeply held by Paul. Notice Paul does not say, I hope so. I think so. But he knows that he will have that crown of righteousness. Can we have assurance of salvation? Yes, absolutely yes. Did you know that all the other apostles died with the assurance of salvation as well? Let me give you a few more examples. Apostle John, for example. He has assurance of salvation in 1 John Chapter 5, verse 11 to 13. And this is the testimony. What testimony? That God has given us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know. Let me repeat that. That you may know that you have eternal life. And that you may continue to live in the name of the Son of God. Now, let's hear from the promise of, uh, from the lips of Jesus himself, okay? Jesus said we could absolutely believe in the assurance of salvation. How? John chapter 6, verse 40 and also 47. Verse 40 says, And this is the will of him who sent me that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him may have everlasting life, and I will raise Him up at the last day. And that's a promise. In verse 47, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. It didn't say will have. He already has it. Jesus gave us a reminder that you and I Possess eternal life. Why? Because of the one who lives in you is an eternal person. Not by myself. When you invite Jesus Christ in your heart, Jesus comes in and who lives in there now, Paul said, it's not I, but Christ who lives in me. It's Christ who, is, who has eternal life right there in your heart is a part of you. Jesus gave us that reminder that you and I possess eternal life because of the one who lives in us. And in the sweet by and by when he comes, you and I will have that opportunity to live eternally, permanently with him at the long table of the banquet that is promised with the Lamb of God with all the Bible heroes, Adam and Eve. Wow, it will be such an awesome thing to have fellowship sitting together at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Yes, at the very first communion with his disciple, when he passed a drink, Jesus said, I tell you, I will drink. I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on, until that day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. That's a promise. And we look forward to that. And until then, we're still here on this earth. We have the good news to proclaim to the whole world. We have work to do. We cannot do it with our pride intact. Jesus knew that. Jesus knew his disciples were not ready. And so he instituted this Lord's Supper. 
We cannot do it with unrepentant heart. He told us how to serve him, how to serve humanity with a servant attitude, with humility. He gave us a symbol of serving others with humility. If you read the whole Gospel of John, well, actually, John chapter 13, that communion ceremony starts with what we now call the food washing ceremony. It's, it's also called ordinance of humili humility to let us know that we should serve him with humility. Serving others is serving Jesus. In Matthew 25, if you have done it to the least of my brethren, you do it to me. So at this time, we're going to separate for food washing ceremony. And then we'll come back and enjoy the Lord's Supper together. Let us separate. Let's have, have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, let this not be just another symbol that uh, we do maybe once a quarter. Let this really sink in our heart. Why you gave this symbol to us. May you be in it. May we pray for each other. May we serve you with humility so that we can be ready for your kingdom. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. God bless us.
I'd like to welcome each one of you for what we call the Lord's Supper. And uh, it's called Lord's Supper. It's a supper, nevertheless, even though it's a tiny one. Uh, but the significance, spiritually speaking, uh, is uh, really great. So uh, I'd like to welcome each one of you for participating in the Lord's Supper. At, uh, at the end of the service, usually uh, we do, I don't know if we have a compassion offering here. We, yeah, okay. All right. Uh, it's churches do differently, so. Uh, there, there's going to be a compassion offering at the end, and uh, so that's, please be ready for that. And also, right after the uh, service, I would like to meet the, our two young people in the other room, and uh, we are continuing to prepare for their baptism, so I'm looking forward to that. I, I just want to let you know that. So at this time, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this symbol you gave us. Uh, we look forward to the day when you uh, will sit down with us at the long table at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, may each one of us uh, be there. May we find each other uh, in your kingdom. I pray that, Lord... Meanwhile, we're still here on this earth. I pray that you would uh, keep us from the evil one, as you tell us in the uh, uh, Lord's Prayer. Please bless our service here today in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. At this time, I'd like to ask the two elders uh, uh, to, read, to lead us into what we call the responsive reading. You can participate. It's in page seven, number 771 in your hymn now. 771. <laughs> One will read the light print. The other will read uh, the, yeah, 771. Let's all stand as we read. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never be hungry, and whoever believes in me shall never be thirsty. But you, as I said, do not believe, although you have seen. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the man who comes to me I will never turn away. I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. It is his will that I should not lose even one of all the things given to me, but raise them all up on the last day. For it is my Father's will that everyone who looks upon the Son and puts his faith in him shall possess eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. In truth, in very truth, I tell you, the believer possesses eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the man in the desert and the day. I am speaking of the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and never die. I am that living bread which has come down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he shall live forever. Moreover, the bread which I will give is my own flesh. I give it for the life of the world. This is a fierce dispute among the Jews. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus replied, In truth, in very truth, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you can have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood possesses eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. My flesh is real food. My blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells 
us continually in me, and I dwell in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who leads me shall live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, and it is not like the bread which our fathers ate, and they are dead, but whoever eats this bread shall live forever. Please be seated. time uh, brother cliff will uh, read uh, will be praying for the bread and uh, and uh, brother mike will be reading for the blessing of the wine as we kneel thank you heavenly father we come to you and we claim your body broken for us, your flesh sacrificed for us, your life poured out for us, and this was what had to be done in order for us to be saved, because we couldn't do it ourselves, and our works couldn't do it, or nothing, and so you went through all that for us, and we thank you for this commemoration of what you have done for us. May we remember it all the time, but especially on this day, may it really strike us and hit us what you have done and what we owe you. And may you, in response, seek to do that which you ask of us. In your name I pray, amen. And loving Father, we thank you again for the reminder that today is of your love for us and what you have done for us. As we partake of the wine which represents your spilt blood, Lord, we pray that you'll help us to understand it, that you'll help us to repent, that you'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness with your robe of righteousness. We thank you for that in Jesus' name.
before we partake of this symbol, I just want to make sure we all got it, those who want to participate. And please raise your hand if we have missed somebody. All right. Let me read from the account of uh, the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and blessed and broke it and take it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of the, vi of the fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. I'd like to read a couple of verses. One is from Mark chapter 11. Verse 24. This is a good promise, uh, promise of assurance. Therefore I say to you, Mark 11, 24, whatsoever things you ask when you pray, Believe that you receive them, and you will have them. No doubt that we have prayed for forgiveness of our sins and shortcomings, and God really forgive. And then in uh, Psalm 32, Psalm 32, verse 1, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. At this time, as the Lord instructed us, to, as they sing hymns, they say they went out from Mount Olives. It says there in John, uh, Matthew 26. Let us all rise and sing our closing song which is 476, burdens are lifted.
Dear Father in heaven, indeed we are weighted down with burdens and heartaches in this world, but your promise comes to us afresh this morning. As uh, someday soon you'll end all our problems and suffering, and we'll sit down with you, having communion. We look, we're looking forward to that day, Lord. Keep us faithful. Lord, we thank you for what you have done for us today, forgiving us our sins and shortcomings, and going out of here with a clean slate. Please fill us with the Holy Spirit that we can have power to walk a Christian walk. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen.